Good morning, everyone. Last year, we had Dr. Paolo Novak from SOAS talking to us on Afghan refugee situation based on his field work uh, on Afghan refugees from 2001 to 2004. And this year, we have with us Dr. Ozala Ashraf Mima. She is, uh, she has been working at the grassroots level. She is a civil society activist working for women's rights and she's currently the director of Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit and Research Associate SOAS. Uh, welcome Dr. Neema. So Pleasure. I would start off my uh, session by, you know, posing you this question that, you know, there's this, I was talking to you about it uh, earlier that there is this general perception in the West uh, about Afghanistan, like it has been a troubled country since its establishment as a modern state. And uh, then there's this image of Afghan women wearing burqa who are like without any agency. But you have done some amazing work in Afghanistan at the grassroots level with various women. And you've also uh, run this underground home-based literacy classes during the Taliban regime. So please tell us a bit about uh, those experiences. Thank you. Um, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here in Calcutta for the first time and being hosted by amazing uh, uh, Calcutta Research Group team members. Uh, when it comes to discuss about the history of Afghanistan and the history of modern state in Afghanistan, one has to remember that um, this is a country that not only in the modern sense but also in a historical sense because of its geopolitical location has been a forefront or a crossroad of conflicts uh, and opportunities so if we go back to the mughal time to the to the to the several other periods before this locality has always been a, a kind of a epicenter for global powers to compete yeah. for global powers to uh, basically to um, negotiate over power and over access and um, over territory. Uh, so Afghanistan's recent and contemporary history is not separated from its longer term history. As a result, I can say that um, over the past, I mean one difference probably that happened over the past 40 years, this very recent uh, episode of war and conflict in Afghanistan is that probably historically it was much more looked at a very sort of a mega level that there has been global power involved and they looked through their intermediary middleman type of like warlords and local power holders but what happened in the 40 years in the past 40 years whether we start with the Soviet invasion in 1970s late 1970s or the recent the US mm -hmm. uh, the level of intervention got further deeper to a very sort of micro to a very local level. So there is an whole overall infiltration to the society at the very lo local and unique levels. And this has created a lot of issues that we see now and probably in a few years from now we will see the consequences of that. Now that's an overall kind of situation where we are. I think one thing that has never changed in Afghanistan's history is this rivalry of global powers. Mm -hmm. When there was polarization, for example, uh, or when there were like, when there were two superpowers in the world, uh, Afghanistan became a center or an epicenter for conflict and war between these superpowers. I'm speaking here about the Cold War period, the Soviet uh, camp and the, the, the US camp. But now, in the recent years, as a result of this whole reconfiguration of the global power relations, what happens in the way it is reflected in Afghanistan as an epicenter for all these rivalries, global and regional rivalries, what is happening now is that all those countries who consider themselves with a level of power, they have a leverage in Afghanistan. They have someone that they sponsor or a line of sponsorship and as a result of that sponsorship they have a stake in the war in the conflict in the illegal and illicit economy and in all of that so that's one sort of overall uh, 
if we can say analysis of what is happening in this country. So at the moment we are a forefront of conflict uh, that we can say is a conflict between the US and its allies on one side and its opponents on the other side. It's much more at the macro and global level. So US and Russia are also in competition in Afghanistan in, in some indirect ways. There is also China emerging and it's in our neighborhood, it's in our relatively close neighborhood. And there are also other rivalries like the India-Pakistan conflict is also being fought in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. The, the Saudi-Iran conflict is being fought in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, you name it. Mm -hmm. you, you name the conflicts and we are a war front for it. Now, what happens in this kind of conflict situation is that often the way it's portrayed is as if the people who are living in these localities or these countries like Afghanistan, they are these hopeless or helpless poor victims of the war. And they have surrendered. And particularly because of this global rhetoric of liberating the Afghan people mm. and liberating the Afghan women, especially in the post-2001 context, what happened was to portray uh, the women of Afghanistan, for example, as a case we can talk about it, was to portray them as these poor and helpless victims who were all surrendering in complete sense to a tyranny of Taliban, to a very dark-minded regime that were autocratic in their way of operating. Uh, we couldn't even consider them fully as a regime in the sense of dominating and governing, but more as a proxy regime or a proxy force that their center of decision-making, their center of operation or command of operation was coming from the neighboring country yet they were operating inside Afghanistan. So under that regime, in order to justify the full military intervention in Afghanistan in the post-2001 context, the way it was sort of explained was that, oh, we have to, you know what the Taliban are doing? The Taliban became a branch. Mm -hmm. They are un identified for destroying the historical heritage. They are identified for lashing women in public. They are identified for forcing women out of, to, uh, out of schools or to wear certain you know, garments like burqas, for example, became very famous. So this whole branding of a, 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 a regime or a, a kind of a power that was autocratic, that was fundamentalist in their views, and that, had to, that, that sort of branding had to open the space for justification of a direct military mm -hmm. intervention. Now it is debatable whether this direct military intervention was purely and genuinely because of 9-11 or because of, you know, the relationship between uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan of the time, or whether it was because of a geopolitical requirement in the region and it just triggered because of what happened there. So, so as a result, this whole rhetoric of liberating the country or liberating the women of this country is very much linked to justification of this intervention directly. And now we also talked of like multiplicity of interventions, not just one Precisely, single, precisely. Uh, In my thesis, I actually highlight this fact of multiplicity of interventions. Now, I was active during that time. I was in my early uh, 20s, I would say. Uh, not taken serious by many people because of my age, but I was quite active, so they could not ignore me. So when at that time, when, when the Taliban were still in power, but 9-11 happened and there were like this kind of an anxiety of what will be next, when the media came to me and asked me, what is your view and what would you ask for? I never asked for military intervention. As an Afghan and as a voice of my people, I said, yes, we need support, we need humanitarian support, we need development support, we need political support to an extent because of what is happening, but I don't think we need military support. Why? Because the Taliban were not destroyed. They disappeared. They were not a force to resist against the new regime that was coming to an existence. They actually disappeared. They vanished. And they were like processes of how they vanished because they had their safe sanctuaries in the neighboring countries. So as a result, but who would listen to an Afghan voice at that time? We became the subject 
of one major intervention that 19 or 18 years on, it's still um, ongoing. The war on terror uh, side of the intervention, I think, was the most distractive, the most failed part of the whole intervention. Because I want to break down the intervention in different forms. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I have to also highlight that the U.S. and its allies are not the sole intervening force in Afghanistan's post-2001 context. Uh, and I come back to that in my uh, conversation later on. But now just to sort of add on, on the victimization of the people and population, what, what, what I challenged from the very beginning was to highlight the fact that, well, actually, Afghan people throw out the history and throw out their their um, a life uh, cycle of you know living under this kind of conflicting environment have always continued to resist yeah. in one or another form. For example, if I look at my own life as an Afghan, I was born in Afghanistan and Kabul. I became a war refugee in Pakistan for, and I lived there for 14 years. And throughout these 14 years, we struggled. My parents struggled, I struggled, and I, the struggle was not for an individual survival of myself. Of course, that was a big part of it. But the struggle also meant that what is the best way to continue this mm -hmm. fight? Defending my people, becoming their vices, and responding to the need of my people. So this is why, I mean, in a most challenging situation of the time, which was you know, a situation where Taliban has forbidden education for girls, uh, based on my own experience as a refugee living in a camp, organizing a small ho home-based class for, for girls in my age, I had that idea. So when I went back to visit my relatives in, in Kabul in 98, I said, why not replicating the same refugee camp idea in Afghanistan? So I knew I was conscious of the risk. I knew I could be killed. My colleagues, those who were with me, because we were a group of people working on that, I knew that it will be risky. But at the same time, I also knew that if we surrender to this form of terror, this is not only a physical terror, it is an ideological yeah. terror. It wants to finish us in the sense of our consciousness, in the sense of our understanding of who we are, where we are heading. So we opened these classes, and uh, as soon as the idea was sort of taking, taking the shape, and started. We had quite a number of classes in Kabul, in Nangarhar, in Mazar Sharif, and later on in Western Afghanistan. So, depending on where we would find, um, you know, women who were able to teach, uh, we would just communicate with them, and they will organize uh, their guest rooms. Yeah. Uh, in Indian con context, you say Betak, I think. The, so, Betak or the yeah. the guest rooms were turned into classrooms, and in this way. Women who weren't ready to do this, and also the students who were ready to attend these classes, we had full support of their families. So men and women in the communities stood with us on this initiative against the Taliban. Interestingly saying, some Taliban also stay quiet about it. One, because they, in, against the communities, they couldn't do anything. And second, not all the people who were working for the Taliban regime, and this is not directly in my case, but later when I go to the uh, uh, to different villages and different communities, I learned the stories of how, for example, in Bamiyan province and Central yeah. Highlands, they've um, they've uh, agreed to uh, actually like the, the the Ministry of Education officials of the district level, they've agreed to let the school um, okay. attended by girls. But they say when the delegation is coming from the center, make sure that the girls are leaving the school. So there was that kind yeah. of arrangement. So the reason I'm always like reminding people of this particular experience is to show that people of Afghanistan has never been fully a victim in a way of surrendering to terror, surrendering to fundamentalist and radicalization ideas. They've always chose to resist, but in their own very small but consistent ways. You know, the National Solidarity Program has been running for a long time now. Uh, how much has uh, the program impacted Afghan women with regard to political participation or electoral rights? Thank you. So the National Solidarity Program was one of the case studies or one of the, 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 the programs 
that it has a full almost I would say 99.9 percent .9 of the territory or the the, the, the country is, uh, is is covered by this program called NSP or National Solidarity Program. It's an interesting program. It's basically um, framed uh, or it is basically formed under the World Bank's community-driven development scheme. Uh, this CDD scheme in, in other countries, for example, in Indonesia, was used mainly for decentralization purposes. But in Afghanistan, it took it another turn, and because of the, 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 the post-2001 realities of commanders having the leadership in every part of the, 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 the country, it took a different shape of becoming a tool to centralize or to, to introduce a different form of a central government to the localities. The NSP had two goals, distribution of resources, governance. Uh, because the government at that time when it was formed was very weak or non-functional in most cases, the distribution of resources part was, the, the actual implementation of whole NSP was mainly uh, the responsibility of NGOs or non-governmental organizations that were considered as facilitating partners. So NGOs have a history in Afghanistan, uh, particularly post-Cold War context of Afghanistan. They have a history of filling the gaps that existed in the absence of a functioning state. So when they come, but of course, NGOs were never the state. They fill the space but not as a state actor. They have always remained to be a non-state actors. So now, because they have taken the implementation of this process, some interesting things happen as a result. One, the conditionality that was pushed, not necessarily by the bank itself, but by someone who is now the president of Afghanistan so far, like we will see what happens in the elections, but uh, uh, President Ashraf Ghani was one of the main ideas behind uh, or, or ideologues, I would say, behind the NSP uh, program in Afghanistan. Uh, another, uh, he was also minister at that point. Of minister, he was minister of finance. Yeah. So he was minister of finance, but also a former, as a former World Bank uh, expert, he was one of the main sort of people who thought about this program. There were also people like the minister of rural uh, rehabilitation and urban uh, rehabilitation and development (MRRD). Uh, Minister Hanif Atmar was also having a crucial role. Hanif Atmar came with, a, with an NGO background himself. He was working with Norwegian Refugee Council, Norwegian Church Aid, so he had an NGO background himself. So all these minds of technocrats, we can say, put together, they have pushed in particularly, when I interviewed uh, President Ghani about the design and formulation of this NSP program, he reminded me, and it was also confirmed by other people, how much he himself as an Afghan pushed for the gender conditionality on NSP. So I come to your yeah. question now, in terms of like how women actually benefited from that. Some people, some even internationally, interestingly, were saying, oh, Afghanistan is a very conservative society. To bring in women at the very local level is dangerous. It can cause, you know, some you know, rebellions and all that. But he says, no, I come from a rural Afghanistan. I remember my grandmother, my mother, and how they were active. Let's just move ahead with that. And because of that kind of insistence from someone at the ministerial level, what happened was, interestingly, that this conditionality became a core part of the NSP. So I have evidences from my research that communities who refuse uh, on the basis or on the ground of not allowing their women to participate in the NSP programs, they were denied any access to the programs. And that created an interesting dynamic at the village level, at the rural communities, because some villages started to, to furnish, you know, to, to have like mm. bridges, to have like schools, to have clinics. The neighboring villages had nothing. So they approached again to the officials of the, the NSP and says like, can you have some kind of yeah. arrangement? And they say, the only arrangement is to make sure that you are, to make sure that you are basically bringing women into the, to the decision making. So they made an arrangement yeah. for some of them. Because huge amount of funds and resources was being yes. dispersed through the I program. think the most, it has its flaws, yeah. because I come to the flaws of the program. One of the main 
uh, failure of the program was to really a real thorough contribution to the governance of the villages. I mean, they've done, but they have not achieved entirely their mm -hmm. goals. In terms of resource distribution, I can say with confidence that NSP was the most successful program in the history of uh, Afghanistan, particularly the post-2001 history of the country. It was the only uh, means or channel of resource distribution in the rural Afghanistan that was consistent and that was happening uh, or making sure that there is you know, something uh, given to everyone. So the distribution was happening there. Of course, because of the institutionalized form of corruption that is part of our unfortunate reality, because of all lack of accountability and so forth, there are challenges. There were corruption cases, there were, but it was least affected in comparison to everything else. Now, I was speaking earlier about the interventions and different forms of interventions. So NSP, as I said, historically is the, the largest program with massive amount of funding. The contributors are almost all European countries and US to an extent. Uh, and so, and they are still operating. Now it's no longer operating under the NSP, but it is operating under something called Citizens Charter. Hmm. Um, in the context of India, if I can sort of like compare it, not entirely because there are lots of differences, but it is more promoting this idea of Panchayati Raj mm -hmm. or this kind of smaller yeah. self or local governance uh, <laughs> systems. When it comes to the question of intervention, unfortunately, the international community did not entirely rely on this form of intervention. So this was happening at the same time during the military surge. And when we say military surge in Afghanistan, we mean 2019 to 2014, where the, the war has escalated and the number of um, soldiers, international military forces have increased. This was during Obama time. Uh, what happened, they have said, oh, we have to focus on stabilization and stabilization they have their own notion in the military, in the counter um, coin, they call it a coin strategy, counter insurgency strategy, is that you attack a place, it's clear, build, hold. So you attack a place, you go and build something, and you try to hold it. So this clear, build, hold kind of approach, they have contradicted with what NSP was doing. NSP was a very slow and smooth process of forming local community councils called CDCs, the Community mm -hmm. Development Councils. There was always, the chief was often, in most cases, men, mm -hmm. the, yeah. the deputy women, and then they had the other members of council that were representing the entire village. And it was done through a secret balloting at the very local level. So it was a very democratic form of, you know, electing people and doing. The military, because of their misconception or because of their own interpretation or understanding of Afghanistan, they divided Afghanistan into these tribes. And they say, oh, like we have to like work, take, it takes a tribe at a time or something like this was like a title of a paper in the military sort of literature. And so they relied on local patronage politics. So they pick a pattern, support that person, and through that they try to sort of govern and they try to rule. It didn't work. Not only that it didn't work, it actually puts the, 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 the true representation of people like the NSP or the DDA, the District, Dis District, Assembly, District Development Assemblies, into a risk because they were not able to really uh, compete with the military, uh, mm -hmm. with the military sponsored councils. So parallel councils started to, to be created at the village level in some cases, but mostly at the district level. Uh, so, Dr. Neemut, you know, on one hand, America is holding talks with the Taliban uh, in Qatar mm -hmm. and elsewhere. But, you know, uh, there are also reports <coughs> that the CIA is using uh, Afghan uh, forces to uh, carry on clandestine operations, performing extrajudicial executions, disappearances. Like, there are reports on Al Jazeera, Human Rights Watch, and elsewhere. So, uh, there are rampant, like, violations of the rights of the civilians so how does the government or activists like you respond or what would be the next step for you well the violation of human rights is something that unfortunately has not been the violation of human rights or the war crimes in afghanistan has not been part of any discussion any serious discussion i would say 
throughout the past 18 years. So yeah, what, what I was saying is that the human rights violation issues have not been addressed in the post, uh, entirely in the post-2001 context. The challenge is that uh, those people who have blood in their hands, most of them are still in power. Uh, some of them join through a peace kind of accords or peace agreements. Others have been part of the post-2001 uh, political settlement. And when you have the perpetrators themselves as the key players in the country, it's very difficult to actually consider any form of transitional justice kind of solutions uh, applying over them. Moreover, when it comes to raising the voices and when, when, when it comes to activism in Afghanistan, it's something that has been happening and it will continue to happen. So we keep, as civil society and human rights activists are still very active in the country, they are uh, the voice of uh, those who are victims of violence and they are also trying to reach to the International Criminal Court and international platforms raising their voices about the violations. And the peace talks that you were mentioning, maybe I can briefly also speak about it. I will talk about it more in my um, conference um, tomorrow. Uh, the peace talk, unfortunately, is less about peace talk, more about basically handing over Afghanistan or sort of leaving Afghanistan to an extent, not entirely leaving, but to an extent getting out or exiting from Afghanistan's political, you know, bargaining and political situation in some ways. That's, that's what the United States want. And what the, the way that it has been happening in the last almost year, I would say last September they have started it, is that they have, the United States have completely um, ab uh, abandoned Afghans, Afghan government, the Afghan state in general or the representation, and have started a direct talk to the Taliban. A Taliban has a political office in Qatar, and this is where mm, the, the channel of the talks are. This has created a lot of concern among the people, particularly among the women, because we are a country or a nation of 30 million, and the United States is not, we are not a state of the United States. As a sovereign state, it's our legitimate right to take part and make in the decision making about our future. So the United States, when we raise our concern, the representative of the United States, who happened to be also an Afghan origin American at the moment, he is keeping on reassuring us that this is going to um, uh, be different because as soon as there is an agreement between the Taliban and the US, then that will be followed by an Afghan intra, by an intra-Afghan dialogue. We, we are facing two challenges at the moment. One. If there is an agreement between U.S. and the Taliban, and the U.S. in some way or form recognizes the Taliban as a main force, that is weakening the government or the state's position. So we are going to be at a huge loss in this situation. If Afghan government is also invited to participate, we as people outside the, the state systems, like the civil society, the women leaders, the human rights activists, we are concerned that whether the Afghan state is strong enough to address our demands as ordinary citizens of the country. Because if a weak state cannot become a strong representation of its nation, it's mm -hmm. only a strong state who can, who is comprehensive in bringing a stronger group of people who represent all different ethnic groups, who represents all different civil society groups, all different, uh, you know, identities within the country. So there is a huge challenge ahead of us. Uh, we've had an election that is uh, uh, becoming in a deadlock situation right now. Two months on, we have no results. So our desire is to see this election concluding in some way so that we can at least have our government in place and then immediately move to the peace, peace talks where we will push further for our full representation in this process because nothing can be discussed and have a real meaning if it is discussed and decided in the absence of people whose lives are oh, affected by this on a daily basis. Thank you, Dr. Nima. That was lovely talking to you. Thank you. Thank it's you. a pleasure. Thanks a lot.